Welcome everyone. So thank you for joining us today for our Printing Museum Spring 2021 Artist in Residence in Conversation. Today we have joining us Diego Canales, Melinda Lozinski, and Jennifer G. Thompson, and they'll be sharing their unique bodies of work they've completed during their res residency and discussing their processes and sharing what it was like joining the creative community here at the museum. So this is our second cohort of artists in residence. The artist in residency program is new. We started it in fall of 2020. So this is our second cohort. We are so excited to have them here at the museum and really looking forward to seeing the work that they've created. The Printing Museum is located in Houston, Texas. So if you are in Houston, in Texas, we hope you'll join us and come visit the museum. We will be having an exhibit of their work, TBD, coming up sometime in the future, hopefully before the end of the year, most likely. And we also, in addition to having the artist studios where our artists and residents have worked, where we have a printmaking studio, a letterpress studio, a papermaking studio, and a litho studio getting back up and running soon. We also have a book, we have a book binding studio. So in addition to our studios, is that we also have the museum, which is a main foundation of the printing museum. We've been open since 1980s. And we also have rotating exhibit space. So behind me in my virtual background, you'll see the Hope is Action letterpress print exchange. We also have following General Sam Houston. Those are the etchings of Bernard Wall. And then we have Heaven, Hell in the Underworld. And those are old masters prints from the permanent collection. So those will be up through the summer if you are in Houston, able to visit us. So I'm going to be turning it over now to our artists and residents. The format for today's talk is that they will each have about 15 minutes and they're going to share their work with you. They will go alphabetically and then at the end we will have time for questions, discussions. So please think of questions you want to ask, hold those, we will be getting to them at the end. All right, so with that up first we have Diego Canales. Thank you, Adrian, uh, for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. OK, so. I proposed to the Printing Museum a, a zine um, project, and it's based on my interest in black holes, and I titled it a Terrestrial Black Hole Fan Club. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you this image right here. This is the first image I saw of a black hole. This is a computer render I saw at, in 2001. And this is what sparked my interest as a child uh, to black holes. Um, seeing something like this, I didn't understand what it was. It was um, a very interesting, like a celestial body. Um, black holes don't necessarily look like this, but it was enough for me to uh, have a continuous curiosity on the subject. Um, not enough for me to uh, study physics or, or astronomy. Uh, after, as I grew up, but um, I definitely kept that uh, interest, especially with it being on the news as I grew up, um, being a topic of science fiction. Um, it was always something that I was always uh, fascinated about. So in April 2019, this is the first uh, image they got of a black hole in uh, Messier 87 galaxy. This is at the core of the galaxy and um, it was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. And pretty much what they did is um, they got different telescopes from around the world and made like a gigantic uh, telescope to capture this. And it required a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of equations, a lot of um, dedication to get an image like this. And when I saw this in 2019, I was extremely impressed. Um, it looks nothing like what they had rendered in the past, but um, 
I was fascinated and I was really um, excited and I wanted to know more. And something that I looked up, um, just Wikipedia articles, anything I could find on this. And I came across um, this black hole math workbook. Um, so NASA made this uh, workbook for high school teachers um, to give like supplementary problems to, to high school students. Um, physics students or algebra students just um, uh, for practice. And it turns out that many of, of the black, like many aspects of black holes are, can be solved using a uh, simple algebra and a little bit more digestible for, to like a common person. You don't have to be um, an astrophysicist to understand some of these concepts. So. I went ahead and dove, dove in. It's a free P PDF you can find. Uh, just look up NASA uh, Black Hole Math and you'll have access to this uh, workbook. Um, there's a variety of concepts and equations in this workbook. Um, so I wanted to make a zine on some of these um, uh, ideas and formulas. Um, I pretty make, much made like a top five like my personal favorites, whatever was interesting. And it's really funny how they um, lay out some of these problems. Um, it's, they also include some sort of uh, humorous kind of science fiction to, to um, give an example of the formulas. Um, so one of them is um, the Schwarzschild equation to find out uh, the radius of, um, of an object given that like you are given its mass. Um, so I, I put here what you need to solve the equation. I knew, I knew where we were gonna be recorded and I did not want to embarrass myself if I have wrong math. <laughs> um, I did try to still like solve it, but using this equation, uh, you can figure out like, um, if Earth was a black hole, right? Um, you get the mass of Earth and you input it in this equation and you find out that if Earth was compressed to the size of, of a black hole, it would be around uh, 17, not maybe 17 and a half uh, centimeters. Uh, so it would be a very small uh, black hole and that's a scan of me holding a black hole. <laughs> and it's also on a print that I made using the Rezo machine. Um, there's other equations that I, that I found. Um, you can find out how long it takes for you to um, get into a black hole. If you're from the outside, you get thrown in there um, and you are going towards a singularity of a black hole and you get to find out how long it would take for you to, to get to that. And um, I'm using a ton. Uh, it's a super, ma super massive black hole in the center of uh, 10618. It's like a super bright uh, quasar. And it contains possibly the largest um, black hole in the entire universe. And it weighs as much as all the suns combined in our, in our Milky Way. So it's ultra massive and it's heavy. And I was using, um, given its mass and it's also radius, you can find out uh, how long it would take for you to get, get to its event horizon from the outside and also from the event horizon to singularity. Uh, using the equations um, that are given. And usually it's something that would take a couple of hundred hours because it's a huge uh, black hole. Um, this is another formula. If you get thrown in there, you can find out how fast you would go. Um, you'd probably die. You're going at incredible speeds. Um, but as you see, I'm using um, these formulas and these concepts to uh, visualize what would be happening and designing um, my zine along the way as I'm solving these kind of problems. Uh, another one is also that 
um, black holes have a lifespan. And eventually, over time, um, black holes evaporate and they, they shrink in size. And you can also determine how long it would take for a black hole to evaporate. And it's, some, it's a process of billions and billions of years. And this is kind of also uh, using the formula to visualize and, and make a, kind of like a symbol to represent what, what an evaporating hole uh, would be like. So this is a cover of my zine. Um, I'm using a risograph to create the, the zines and I was limited to, compared to a CMYK printer, um, I cannot print in color. I have to uh, work with what I have, right? So the, print, the printing museum, we use uh, black and we use a sunflower yellow. Um, I think we recently acquired um, blue, but when I first started this project, we were limited to those two colors. So um, I was set to these kinds of parameters. Um, and I was, it was a very interesting challenge as well. And I'm using also uh, the font Aspen. It was, uh, it's a, it's a font uh, designed by Inez de, uh, de Vado in France. And, and the reason why I chose this font was because initially my cover for the zine looked something like this. Um, it was very uh, sober. It was very um, straightforward. And I was actually using uh, NASA's standards uh, and like design standards as a reference. Um, I wanted something a little bit more serious. And after I got some comments from friends, once I started showing this to them, um, they did mention that it wasn't very approachable. So I ended up uh, deciding on a more um, beautiful um, font. And black holes is one of those subjects that is it's interesting, but it's very uh, unapproachable, even though it's, uh, I came to find out that it's a very simple, uh, it could be very simple to, to get into. I'm sure that it can get extremely complicated at some point. Um, but I wanted to make this kind of community where you don't have to be a physicist or you don't have to be a mathematician to appreciate uh, some of these uh, concepts. And I'm using this font kind of like to invite them to, to get into this kind of uh, topic and to create uh, artwork around this topic as well. Uh, hence the name like a fan club for black holes. And it's kind of like a prom promotion of that and especially with Rezo making uh, zines a little bit more accessible and cheaper to print. Um, I would love to get a community going of artists creating uh, art based on black holes. So a huge difference from what I have now to what I had before. Um, this is the single single color Rezo that we had at the printing museum. We now do have a a two color Rezo. Um, the single color Rezo was pretty interesting because it felt like I was um, screen printing. So I have a background in uh, screen printing, um, and it felt like exposing screens, but and also setting up my documents to do um, to do the Rezo prints. Uh, it was almost the same as creating um, the negatives for my screen printing. So it's just a little bit easier. It's a little bit less labor, and and the Rezo does that for you. Instead of using light, uh, I think the Rezo burns a master sheet over a, an ink drum to create the image, but your documents have to be set in grayscale. Um, this is an example of what you get. You get some very interesting um, printing texture. Um, 
and you also get misalignments. You get a lot of flaws that that maybe like a CMYK printer would wouldn't uh, create. So it's a really nice feel, and it's a really nice visual that you get out of these um, risographs. And um, it's also extremely fast, and it's um, it's an affordable uh, method to print. Uh, so I plan on, even though it's the zine that I plan on doing, it's going to have a variety of uh, posters and the zine itself. Like I do want to price it at a reasonable and um, obtainable price, something that that it won't hurt you too much to uh, obtain. This is an example also of um, some of the errors that can happen as you're printing, um, which can be really useful to get inspired to create something uh, on purpose. There's some ghosting here. I was able to scan uh, and save this mistake. Um, so no matter what comes out of it, even if it's a flaw, it's I'm just amazed at, at what it can do, even at its errors. And it, I was able to um, use some of these flaws to design some of the, the posters that I created. And um, I was also able to create a variety of uh, posters for this zine. Um, it's a, it's an interesting process and different kinds of paper that you can put in there. Um, you get a variety of results. Uh, how you adjust your documents, your opacities is really important. But I'm still exploring the Rezo. And as I start, continue to develop the, the zine, I would love to explore more on, on the settings and opacities and, and create different things. Um, I do rec recommend you all to follow me on my Instagram. Uh, it's O-Z-O-T-S-O, -O -O. that's my alias that I also produce under. And I would love to have you all follow and, and see how I um, progress on this project. And that is it for me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give the floor to uh, my fellow uh, residents. Thank you, Diego. So up next, we have Melinda. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so um, I'm Melinda Lazinski, and I, oh, let me see. Okay, so I, um, I have a degree in painting, and I also make sculptures. So um, I started working with paper kind of sculpturally at the beginning of uh, the pandemic when we were, you know, being asked to stay inside and everything. And um, before that, I had been working with ceramics, which is very, you know, communal and you have to have a space and a kiln and share equipment. So it kind of took that process away from me. So I started thinking about um, how can I continue this kind of same vein of work um, in a new material and explore um, a different process that's more accessible for something that I can do in my own home. Um, so this first slide is uh, from left to right, a ceramic sculpture, a painting, and then um, an early paper sculpture. So what I started doing um, at the beginning of 2020 was working in my bathtub <laughs> with the watercolor paper um, and buying round, round sheets of paper um, that were sized and handmade and soaking them and then uh, lifting them out of the paper, manipulating it, folding it, painting it, um, which I was really enjoying. Uh, the process is really similar in a lot of ways to um, clay and painting where you're layering and, and working with these kind of uh, chemical factors. But um, I felt like there was something lacking with, you know, not making the paper myself and wanting to explore um, dyeing pulp and, you know, using some more legit equipment. So when I applied for the residency, um, I was really wanting to learn just more about paper making. Um, I hadn't made paper since I was an undergrad about 
10 years ago. So I had a lot to learn. Um, this is my studio desk at home. So I always have like 10 or 20 things in progress. Um, and a lot of these sculptures, I'm working on a base piece of paper and adding a lot of other elements to them. Um, I work with collage a lot. So I have these little kind of bits and you know weird things that I'll uh, put onto um, the paper and just kind of, uh, I thrive under chaos and having all these things uh, surrounding me. Um, but you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I think what I was really interested in working with paper for was it felt like the one thing maybe I had some control over. Um, and I didn't want to work on paintings, like they were too flat. Um, I just wanted something that I could really feel and manipulate. So I really appreciate the tactility and um, resilience of paper. It's a really strong material. Um, but it also, of course, is very vulnerable to to breaking apart. And I like that kind of, you know, it's a little poetic um, of a medium. So I, I felt like it really, I was really responding to that when I started um, working at the printing museum. So when I started working, um, I learned how to make uh, just flat sheets of paper again with Kathy. So I was working with the mold and deckle and making small sheets of paper. Um, and I wasn't really sure what to do with them at first. So I started um, a transfer process, which is something I do on my paintings a lot, kind of related to printmaking in a way where I was taking this film and making a, a transfer. So it would reveal one side um, and put it on the paper to the right. So the image on the right is a piece of vinyl film and the white uh, negative space is the um, vinyl that was transferred to the paper on the left. So it's this kind of holographic uh, shifting iridescent material. So I like that kind of um, idea of what was left behind um, from one to the other and that kind of uh, transference and collection, um, which I think I was also responding really to the exhibitions at the museum and the permanent collection thinking about um, how information has shifted and, and things like that and um, traveled over the, the centuries. And then next I was working with Kathy, learning how to make kind of shaped paper pulp pieces, which, you know, um, working with Kathy was amazing. I just kind of, you know, I'd learn one thing and then I'd ask her 30 questions about what I could do next. Um, so she was amazing because she really encouraged me to, you know, explore and just um, try different things. And she'd be like, you know, just try it, you know, see what happens. Um, and that's exactly how it works. So I started making little baby um, papers on the mold and deckle, uh, dyeing pulp um, with pigments, uh, which I really responded to, you know, as a painter kind of making a color palette and seeing how much material or color you need added um, because the paper also dries lighter um, than when it's wet. So there's a lot of, you know, kind of chemical and pigment things to, to figure out. So I started working on um, these shaped pieces that I then would um, glue onto larger, larger bits. So there's a lot of like cannibalizing material in my process. Um, you know, making one thing, sitting with it for a couple of weeks, and then eventually it figures out where it wants to be. Um, also, you know, during my time here, a lot of what I was doing was learning new processes and exploring um, all the different additives and things that you can work with in paper. So um, I really, you know, I love this kind of nerdy science, uh, very much feels like ceramics and, and uh, paint. Um, you know, how much how much uh, methyl cellulose glue do you need to make something stick in a, a bunch of paper pulp? Or how much pigment do you need to get a certain color? Um, what can you embed? So I started taking, you know, I just have pages of notes on um, additives, the way I was added, adding them, um, the order. So it was pretty, um, you know, it was like very, very much uh, explorative, but then also having to learn these, uh, you know, things to actually make the process happen and, and do what it wanted. So I started working with uh, formation aid and coagulant medium retention aid um, and mixing a lot of different um, pigments and making palettes up. So the, the little um, cups in the middle, those are, you know, just yogurt containers and I just mix a bunch of colors. I'll mix like 30 at once and then work with them over a couple of days. Um, and then the image on the bottom is some of the little palettes I was testing out. Um, so whenever I would make a color, I would just uh, 
put a little tiny blob, <laughs> like a piece of gum on the paper to just see, okay, what is this going to be like when it dries? Is it going to actually stick to the paper? Does it need more glue? So it kind of helped me think about, um, you know, what the material can do and how I can kind of push it a little bit further um, as a record of the process. I also started making uh, molds. So this was like a big thing for me, even though uh, I do make sculptures. So I never took um, a mold making class or learned the, you know, like real sculpture processes. So uh, making a mold of a, a small piece of paint um, was something that was really exciting for me just using um, like a silicone gel. So the little pink uh, piece is a piece of paint that I've had for a long time. It has uh, crushed glass and glitter in it. Um, it's lived on paintings and gotten torn off. So I wanted to make um, a mold so that I could make multiples of one um, paint mark. So the image on the right is a little uh, paper pulp blob of that um, that mark. So again, thinking of multiples and uh, how one, one piece can shift having different versions of one um, kind of paint skin. And I'm working on making a larger one uh, that's kind of a big sculpture of them all, all together. It's pretty, pretty fun. Um, I also was working with embedding different materials in the paper. Um, the image in the middle is a, um, a white and pink sheet of paper that I embedded some acrylic paint skins into just using methyl cellulose glue. And the image on the left, that like really chunky uh, blob that's yellow and turquoise is a some dyed pulp with glitter in it, um, which Kathy was like, no glitter in the museum, you know, so like just FYI, glitter is happening at home um, on my porch, it's not happening in the museum. Um, and then it's sealed with uh, an acrylic medium, so, you know, they won't come out or anything. So I've been really enjoying figuring out uh, using mediums together. Um, paper things, print things, painting things, and kind of bringing these all together. And then the image on the right, um, I'm going to move myself. Uh, this is a small piece of paper that I made at the very beginning with some embedded um, pieces of blue jean paper. And then I put a transfer sheet of vinyl um, over that. So it kind of shifts and has this um, metallic mirrored quality as you move along the paper. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of making some 2D things here too, even though I said I was going to make sculptures. Um, so I'm doing a little bit of both. Sometimes they become three-dimensional though. Um, so the process that I work with to make these uh, sculptures, they start out in um, in the bathroom um, on the floor usually. So this is a large piece of watercolor paper. And I started this before the residency, um, I think last summer. And I never really knew what to do with it until... Um, I was about halfway through the residency, so I wasn't really feeling the painting anymore. So I threw it back in the tub and then kind of inverted it. And so um, the image on the right is how <laughs> this is how the sausage gets made. Um, so a lot of binder clips, a lot of, um, you know, just just letting things hang out and, and dry. Um, I use a lot of starch uh, on the paper to kind of hold it into place, but um, papers pretty pretty strong so I mean usually it's just overnight drying with some clips on it it will um, hold its shape and kind of figure out the form that it wants to take and then after that I will gesso it or or add other things um, to the surface this is the other side of that piece um, on the left and then on the right is uh, the sculpture at its current point so I started painting the outside and then um, this kind of blob on it is a, a giant pulp uh, paint skin. So I'm kind of using these pieces as a base and then applying um, different materials to them, uh, such as these. So over the years, I've collected a lot of um, lenticular scraps. Those are cut off from making my, my paintings, um, pieces of acrylic paint. Um, just, you know, I, I collect a lot of stuff and I'm kind of uh, I have a hard time getting rid of things. So when I was thinking about um, making paper and making sculptures, I really wanted to incorporate all of those into the work and really embed them and make them part of the material um, themselves. So I just have this massive stack of stuff that I will pull from and um, embed into, into the work. So this is a finished uh, 
sculpture that had gone through a lot of uh, folding, a lot of different processes. So this is a watercolor paper with some um, dyed pulp and uh, paint and a vinyl skin on top of it. So these are all the different views um, of this one piece. And it's about maybe 10 inches tall. One thing I learned during this process and working was, you know, I thought it'd be really easy to make like a four foot sculpture out of paper. Um, turns out it's not <laughs> so easy. Um, you know, Kathy and I were talking about uh, using um, mesh or wire or something. I'm, I'm very stubborn, so I really want the material to be the form. Um, for some reason, it just doesn't work for me to make make the mesh into a thing and then cover it. I just want the the material to um, to be its own thing and to to actually be the form and the color. So I've been just working with paper. Um, this one is made out of a piece of cotton linter. So it's a sheet that you would purchase to make into pulp. Um, so it has this nice kind of ribbed uh, texture. So again, you know, just kind of folding it, um, adding a lot of paint skins. Paint is also much heavier than paper. So one thing I think about a lot when I make these is how to balance the weight of um, the paper and that softness with the, the weight of the material that I'm adding. Um, because sometimes, you know, I'll think it will be one way and then it will topple over because of um because of that so it's a lot of you know kind of back and forth um let me move this so you can see the whole thing this is a a pretty tall sculpture um with this one I started thinking okay how can I make um how can I make things taller or add height to a sculpture um, without having that mesh or this kind of armature? So I started uh, attaching papers together that I had made. So the little purple and blue piece on the bottom was one of my first um, flat pieces of paper that I had made uh, using a mold and deckle with Kathy. And I just folded that up. Um, it didn't have any sizing in it. So it was really easy to just manipulate it, let it dry and then stack this other piece on top. So I started thinking about um, building forms from small sort of modular pieces. Um, and then this piece also has uh, some kind of non, non art materials in it or non painting or clay materials, uh, some uh, plastic flowers from the dollar store uh, kind of loops around um, the piece within it, within the paper. Um, and then this long strip on the top, this is a piece of lenticular film. So lenticular is um, an image that's made with two or three different viewpoints in one photo so that as you move around it, the image uh, moves. So they're really kind of kitschy. You know, I get them at the dollar store and they just really fascinate me. So I have all these scraps of them. Um, and what I've been really liking about having them in the sculptures is they add an element of movement um, because sometimes they're not glued down all the way. So they'll kind of be blowing in the AC or the wind and um, you kind of catch this little bit of a flower moving or something like that. Um, so they kind of related nicely to the materials in that this is a close up of um, the lenticular scrap. So you can see this uh, tulip in here. And then this piece in the back with the jewel, this is a uh, paint skin that I had made from, or a, sorry, a paper skin that I had made from a mold um, of a paint skin. So it has different colored uh, pulp uh, pressed in with some jewels. So that was when I was sort of figuring out how to embed things in the, the pulp and then attaching those. Um, this is another finished piece with uh, lenticular and um kind of a lot of different materials ink acrylic paint um paper pastels and then uh this one i started having the lenticulars extend up almost like thinking about them like a, a flower or something that was um not just on the piece, but really extended from it. So this one has a lot of movement as you walk around. And this is, I think, the tallest one I've made. It's probably two and a half feet tall. Um, and this is made from a vinyl transfer on watercolor paper, um, paper, clay, cardboard, um, and acrylic paint. Um, and then what I've been doing lately is working with 
um, a screen at home um, on my porch with this dyed pulp. So um, the screen is about 30 by 30. And I just mix up a lot of different colors and then kind of pour it on the screen. And then as it dries, see what happens. Um, this one, I folded it up into a sort of, uh, almost looks like a wave in the corner. Um, and it has some embedded uh, things from the dollar store, uh, found material, and um, lots of dyed pulp on it. And then this is a new piece in progress um, that's folded up from a completely handmade uh, paper pulp piece on that screen. So uh, again, using the clips and tape to kind of hold it in place as it dries, and then I'll be adding on to that. Um, this is the one that I currently have drying on the screen um, where I put a lot of uh, a lot of pulp and paint chips and confetti, things like that. And this is a detail of what it looks like up close. So I just want to say thank you to everyone at the museum um, for, <laughs> for helping me and for your support and especially to, to Kathy. I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Melinda. Hi, hello. I am Jennifer Thompson, if I don't know you. And I will jump right in. So coming into the residency, I had a little bit of experience with letterpress um, with graduating um, with my MFA this past December. I'd gotten my feet wet with the letterpress world and I was ready to do more because the studio space was taken away from us um, being in the pandemic and uh, we went from classes to the virtual experience. So having the opportunity to uh, run away from my home and visit Houston <laughs> once a month has been a real joy to get to jump in and just spend time uh, working specifically in the area of letterpress as it turns out. Um, so I started with a few thank yous. I can't appreciate, uh, let you know how much I appreciate this time of being able to explore and use all the studio spaces has been such a joy. Um, as I came in, one thing that I found was really helpful for me was volunteering because I wasn't familiar with the space. I didn't know you know, what sort of equipment was available or what was going on inside. So being able to come in and uh, go through all the type cases and be familiar with the fonts and know where everything is really helped me just kind of settle into the area and feel comfortable in moving forward. And so as I did that, I found bits and pieces in different areas that I wanted to use and try and learn because I'm still in a learning phase of growing in my knowledge of abilities. And so I tried to follow some rules and there's uh, some actual rule that I printed. Um, so each one of the lines on the left here is a separate um, piece of metal uh, which was really exciting. So I got to place all of those and experiment with layering colors um, and seeing how those lined up and creating different <clears throat> compositions with just the slightest shift of space and turning that. Um, and then working while Jessica is there has been also really wonderful. Just bounce my ideas off of her and get advice and she's been super kind with her uh, instruction and helping me move forward with that. So learning about pressure printing and this whole new process was so exciting to see and then be able to explore with my own work and embroidery being a regular thing that women did historically and then pulling it into the press um, and using ink. So I embroidered a piece of fabric to test it out and use different stitches and not really knowing what it was gonna look like. And then down below, um, is the result of the embroidery and the first printing. Um, so the French knots left these circular shapes and you still see all of the stitches in the back that you don't see um, in the top image that came through, which was really exciting and almost gave it sort of an x-ray feel because you see what's behind in the hidden part as well as what's intentional, more intentional in the front. 
Um, and then the image on the right here um, is the sort of the imprint that's left on the plate um, that I just ran without re-inking um, and just printed straight from that, which was a really neat result as well. So continuing my learning with pressure printing, I wanted to try a few more things. And with us being in the pandemic, I thought a, a great thing to learn from or to use that we're all really familiar with at this point would be the face masks that we're wearing or, or have worn for the past several months now. So I stitched those to a piece of paper. And over here on the left, uh, you see where I've just put little stitches just to barely hold it in place. And then the image on the right is uh, the result of adding ink and getting that impression on paper, which was really exciting for me. And then layering that image with uh, type and text, uh, finding a font um, or a typeface that was in a typecase that I felt would be applicable and would layer well with a color was really exciting because we've just always been in math season lately. And this series is what has led to what I'm going to continue to do on my next last two visits to the museum is sort of a isotyping process. So here you see uh, letters that I found. Um, I limited my focus to the letters TXFA for the Texas female artists. With my graduate studies, I focused predominantly on developing a platform for them. So with this residency, in the end, what I wanted to do was to find a way to connect my graduate studies with my own personal creative research. So I limited uh, these letters for what I would use moving forward. I printed each of the letters. So on the left, you see each of the letters that I printed. So I had a couple of each letters uh, that I printed just in black to start out with. In the image in the middle on the left, there's a ruler that you can just barely see for scale to show the size. Um, all of these were printed on one sheet of paper. After I printed them to get all of the nice details and the wood type and all the different surfaces and effects that you get with that printing process. On the right, I took each of the letters in Photoshop, photographed them, scanned them, and made them a separate layer. And then taking the other letters as well, so I could start to manipulate and create a new composition just with parts of the letters that were really interesting, the shapes, the negative spaces created to use these limitations for future compositions. So on the right, you see how I've started to crop in and narrow down the different aspects of each letter, um, the specific qualities of the typeface that I used, um, and still just keeping it in the black. Down below, my color scheme for my graduate studies uh, was what you see here. Um, a red variation, a yellow variation, a blue, and then a gray or a black. So this was my color scheme moving forward that I'd already chosen to keep that the same. And I started to apply each of these colors to the letters within Photoshop as I started to work with them. And that's where I kind of had the most fun and exciting part uh, is creating all the possibilities of what I could do with each letter and the layering of the colors or the shapes. Um, so these are my potential print ideas that I came up with going forward. Different compositions, just creating my ideas, putting them together in new ways, exploring, learning a lot. 
So as I developed those ideas, I took those to the press and I had cut out uh, shapes to limit just this area to print on the paper. So instead of printing the whole letter, um, as we saw previously, I just had a certain shape or section of each letter that I wanted to transfer to the paper. And as I did that, I started to create the compositions that you saw before. So this is the one that I have completed. And on the left, you see the digital version of that layout. And then on the right is the actual printed material that I finished. So it was close to the computer rendering, but it's been a really fun and exciting process to learn. And then over the next two or three weeks, I'll be going back to work on completing those other compositions that I showed you previously. And that's it for me. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, thank you all of our artists for sharing such amazing photos of their work and telling us about their process. And this is the point of our program. We have about 12 minutes left in the hour where we'd like to open up the floor to, to everybody that's here. Please feel free to unmute yourselves, ask questions or put them in the chat if you're more comfortable with that. And I'm happy to read them out. We had such a great time having you as our artist in residence at the museum. Um, so Melinda mentioned uh, kind of like coming into it, what some of her expectations were and kind of things that she learned like creating a four foot sculpture may be harder. Uh, so Diego or Jennifer, maybe what were some of the um, other kind of things that you took away? Maybe you, you started down this path or thought you would do this, but you found a different direction and went that way instead. I didn't know I was going to be using a Rezo machine when I started the residency, but it was something that Jessica re um, immediately recommended once I, um, we talked about what my project was going to be about and that I was going to uh, develop a zine. And um, I had never used a Rezo before. I didn't, know, I didn't really know how it worked. I thought it was like a Xerox machine, but it's a hundred times more interesting than like an office like Xerox machine. I was pretty, um, I'm pretty excited about working with it in the future. And it's, it's one of those things that I feel like I'm going to keep doing uh, for a long time. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And thank you kind of explaining too what a risograph was for those that don't know. It really is an interesting machine. It's a stencil duplicator that's kind of thought of as a cross between screen printing and photocopying. Yeah. I thought that I was going to focus predominantly just on um, more broadside poster making. And so coming into the museum and being able to explore different aspects of working with um, the letterpress and the different processes and approaches was really exciting uh, for me to be able to learn these techniques that I had no idea even were possible um, with my limited information and, and knowledge of letterpress printing. Yeah, I loved, uh, Jennifer, your masks um, that you you took the pressure printing um, technique and ran with it in that way. And so pressure printing is one of the alternative letterpress uh, workshops that Jessica Snow, uh, our letterpress studio manager, who's also on the call, recently taught. And so she also taught um, Lego printing. So to everyone here too as well, you know, keep an eye out for our workshops that are coming up. And if you're interested in volunteering at the museum, because that's a great hands-on way to get involved and see what all we have in our collections and get exposed to all these different things, we would love to have you anytime. Just feel free to get in touch with us. We had a question from Mauricio in the chat, Diego. Are there plans to have some of your designs printed on shirts? Not sure if they're already available. Um, I didn't have that planned, but I, I'm always interested like in like packaging uh, my zines and like what what they include um, or what I can include with it. In the past, I've 
made like um, totes for for like a zine release. Um, so it's something that I, I would consider. I would definitely consider that. And Diego, what was the scale of your your prints that you were making? Are they? Yeah, so the I'm printing on 11 by 17. That's a tabloid or a ledger. I don't know. I think they're both correct, but um, I'm printing on 11 by 17. And the zine itself, it's going to be uh, 11 uh, by 8.5. Yeah, so. It's kind of like a letter size uh, zine. Gotcha. OK. So we have another one in the chat from Eva. Really interesting work from everyone's part for Melinda. I really enjoyed your work and how it's a very playful aspect to it. You mentioned how you like to use glitter. And I noticed that many of your pieces you used a butterfly glitter and was wondering if there was a motif that was considered. Yeah, um, that's a good question. The butterfly glitter gets everywhere. Um, so um, yeah, I think a lot of my color palette and use of glitter and things comes from, you know, kind of growing up in the 90s and being surrounded by these kinds of colors and everything plastic and, you know, uh, very disposable consumption. So a lot of times when I'm making my work, I'm kind of thinking about those um, you know, celebratory colors. Uh, I look at cakes a lot. I look at minerals a lot. Um, I think that all kind of filters in as I'm working. Um, you know, I know that glitter, <laughs> glitter can definitely be uh, off-putting, um, which is kind of why I like it. You know, sometimes I, I really want my sculptures to be, um, you know, I want there to be a pole where someone wants to maybe touch them or or some people say like, oh, I want to eat that, you know, it looks delicious, blah, 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 or or like, oh, that's kind of gross. So I like that kind of contrast um, in material. Yeah. Jennifer, um, I'm intrigued by your interest in using embroidery. Will your posters be additioned? And so your embroidery will be consistent across the posters or will they be more like mono prints and they'll be very individual. My thoughts today, because I haven't started that stitching yet because I haven't finished any of them completely. Um, so that part will happen post residency because I don't need the studio to do that. Um, I was thinking about doing an addition of three to five. So a more of a limited scale um, as opposed to a, a larger addition. Um, but I have considered of having at least a couple of monoprints ideas as well. So I have a little bit more of a free form um, and not being so regimented uh, with that consistency, which I thought would be exciting as well. Thanks. And this is kind of a technical question. How has the idea of embroidering on the paper informed the paper choice itself? I've tried stitching on paper and, you know, it it tears really easily depending on what you're printing on or what yeah um i had a small show this past january or february and i did small collages with embroidery so i really got to kind of try that out and what kind of led me forward with um this idea and the thicker the paper obviously the better because that thinner one does not work well at all very hard tears and rips and no one's happy at the end of that. Um, so yeah, and I love a thick paper, really nice texture is always really great. So that's why I'm leaning more towards um, with that series. Yeah, that's an interesting thought on paper. It does make a big difference. Um, and there's so many varieties of paper too. And, Melinda, I loved your mad scientisting with all of your notes on all the additives that you were putting in the paper. Um, about how many additives, what, how many variables were you working with there? Oh man, so I was working with pigment, so that's retention aid. Um, there's also a coagulant medium, which makes the paper uh, chunkier, thicker. Um, there's formation aid, which makes it 
the paper uh, thinner, it slows down the, um, yeah, it just, it just thins the paper. <laughs> uh, and then I was also working with uh, kaolin clay, which uh, reduces the shrinkage, but it really also depends on the order. So if you use um, coagulant medium, I think without retention aid, this is in my notes, uh, which I don't have in front of me, but um, it could actually cause the coagulant medium to react like a um, formation aid. So instead of thickening the paper, it will thin it out. So there's a lot of different, you know, kind of trial and error and figuring things out. Um, and then of course the methyl cellulose glue um, and the sizing. So the sizing will help the paper be less absorbent. One thing I was running into at the beginning was the sizing, um, just seeing how much to put in because you don't want the paper to completely fall apart like what Jennifer was talking about. You know, um, you really need that strength in it, but then you can add too much where the paper won't absorb uh, material. So it's, yeah, it's been a process. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love you sharing your process with us. Thank you. Diego, how will you distribute your your or how do you see distributing your work and will it be an open edition? So I'm thinking of right now I have like um like I'm basing it based on like the successful covers that I made. I think I messed like 15 up, so now I have like uh like 85 uh successful prints and i think of selling uh 50 and maybe giving uh some away like the rest away to my friends and and, and partners at the museum <laughs> and and friends here in houston just to and still make it like accessible um i think at some point uh i would probably um i have a, a big cartel like a online store and i would probably distribute them that way we have another question in the chat for melinda it seems to me that if there isn't a book about unconventional paper making that you'd be the one to write it. I would absolutely read that book. What a fascinating process. Thank you for teaching us about your process. I've never been interested in paper making before, but now you have me curious to get my hands wet. So Melinda. Well, thank you. It's so much fun. Actually, I teach as well um, at Houston Community College, and I'm really looking forward to when we get back in the classroom introducing paper making into my um, courses because I think you know it can be applied to design, drawing, painting. I mean basically every class they teach, we're going to be making paper. So hopefully they like it too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so Melinda worked with our master artist, uh, Kathy Gurwell, and she is also available for private classes too. If anyone is in the Houston area or wants to travel to Houston, we're not that far away. Um, Kathy is also available for teaching private paper making classes if you have a project or idea in mind. Kathy can work with you. And similarly for letterpress, uh, we also have private classes available with Jessica for letterpress um, instruction, in addition to just the regularly scheduled workshops that we have. And do, we do have coming up this summer a great letterpress intensive uh, workshop that will get you squared away for our open studios um, that we have as well. So once you are qualified on the printing equipment and other things at the museum in that area, you are more than welcome to come by and make use of our open studios time. So that is another kind of pilot program that we've got going on at the museum. We've always got lots happening and want to thank you all for joining us today. We are right at an hour. So thank you so much. Um, again, Diego, Melinda, Jennifer, it's been a pleasure having you. Uh, we've absolutely loved having you a part of the Printed Museum. Thank you.